Welcome to the Underground. Hi, I'm Mario Bueno with the Leaderboard, and today we're going through the complete timeline of Toby Fox's Undertale. As most of you know, this game has many different outcomes and timelines, but today we'll be looking at the true pacifist timeline. And uh, this is your spoiler alert right now, because I am going to cover literally everything that happens in the game. Also, I know there are a lot of good theories out there, but I'm going to be sticking to things that are strictly canon. The Peace Before the War In the beginning, monsters and humans live in peace with one another and everything is chill. Humans eventually grow weary of the monsters. They have good reason to, but they fear the potential power of a monster who has reaped a human soul. So naturally a war breaks out, like you do. The humans claim an easy victory and in an act of so-called mercy lock the monsters away in the underground. They seal the monsters away with a magic spell creating the barrier around Mount Ebbet. Many, many years pass before the two races ever cross paths again. The Life and Death of Asriel Asgore and Toriel Dreamer rule the monsters in the underground. Together they have a son named Asriel Dreamer. Everything is pretty okay until Asriel discovers an injured human child named Kara, who has fallen into the underground. Yep, that pregame cutscene you see there actually shows Kara falling into the underground, not Frisk. Asriel decides to bring Kara to his home. Once there, Toriel and Asgore agree to adopt this lonely human as their own. Hope surges through the underground. Sometime after Asriel's birth, royal scientist Dr. W.D. Gaster creates the Core, a source of magical electricity for the underground. After completing his invention, the scientist disappears. No one knows what happened to Dr. Gaster, but Alphys becomes the new royal scientist in his absence. Even though they found a new home, Kara doesn't exactly intend to stay in the underground. No, their goal is to harvest a monster soul so they can get vengeance on the humans in their village. We don't exactly know why Kara wants to attack humanity, but a need for revenge guides Kara's actions from here on out. One day, Kara and Asriel decide to make a pie for Asgore. But instead of using butter like the recipe calls for, they accidentally use butter cups, which turn out to be poisonous. Asgore becomes very ill, but eventually makes a full recovery. It's later implied that this was Kara's attempt at taking Asgore's soul. After Kara's possible failed murder attempt, they formulate a new plan to get their revenge, by poisoning themselves. The poison takes effect quickly. Kara tells Asriel that their dying wish is to see the golden flowers of their home village on the surface one last time. With that, Kara dies, and their soul is absorbed by Asriel. Now combined, Asriel and Kara share control over Asriel's body. Asriel carries out his sibling's final wish and takes their body to the surface to see the flowers once more. Once he emerges, he comes face to face with a mob of furious humans. The humans take one look at Kara's body and immediately assume that Asriel killed them to take their soul. The humans attack, mortally wounding Asriel. In his last moments, Asriel flees back to the underground with Kara's body and dies. His body turns to dust and spreads across his father's garden in the capital, leaving only Kara's body behind. It's later implied that this too was another plot of Kara's, that their plan all along was to combine their soul with Asriel's, so they could use his body to attack the village. There's also some evidence that when the humans attacked, Kara tried to take control of Asriel's body to fight back, but because Asriel's will won, they fled. Outraged and heartbroken by the loss of his children, Asgore declares war on the humans once more, vowing to kill anyone who sets foot in the underground. And if humans were still foolish enough to venture into the underground, he would take their souls to break the barrier and wage war on the surface. Toriel is disgusted by this violent plan, so she leaves and takes Kara's body with her. Now alone in the ruins, Toriel gives Kara a proper burial. She vows to protect any human that falls into the underground from Asgore. After Asriel's death, in the years following Asriel's death, six humans fall into the underground and all six of them die. Asgore uses each of their souls to become extremely powerful. Someday he'll be strong enough to break the barrier, but not yet. In the meantime, some other notable events take place. While the light of the surface is still out of reach, the underground gets the next best thing. An extremely charismatic robot star. Alphys creates Metaton, and the robot soars to superstardom in the underground. The monsters welcome any distraction from their dark lives. After spending her childhood training with Asgore, a badass fish lady named Undyne is appointed the head of the Royal Guard. Around the same time, the Skeleton Brothers, Sans and Papyrus, show up in Snowden. Determination Experiments After losing six humans to the underground, the surface dwellers finally wise up and like put some caution tape up or something because no other humans fall into the underground for a very long time. But Asgore still needs one more soul to break the barrier and he's starting to get a little desperate. He tasks Alphys with finding some other means of breaking the barrier. Alphys follows blueprints from an unknown source that might be Gasper. She learns how to use the DT extraction machine to take the determination from human souls that Asgore has already reaped. 
First, Alfie's attempts to unlock the power of a human soul by injecting determination into dying monsters' bodies. But the determination is too much for their bodies to handle, so the monsters melt together and form amalgamates. Her first experiment is a failure, but Alfie's has another idea. What would happen when a being without a soul gained the will to live? She's got a massive crush on Asgore, so to impress him, she decides her test subject will be the first golden flower that blooms in his garden. She executes the experiment, but it seems to be a failure as well. However, the flower disappears a few days later. In the wake of these failures, Alfie's anxiety skyrockets. She stops all of her experiments and vows never to speak of them again. The Era of Flowey. Well, turns out that whole flower experiment wasn't a failure after all. See, Asriel wakes up in his father's garden, now in the form of, yes, a golden flower. He starts to cry, and Asgore finds him. Asgore is overjoyed to kind of have his son back. He comforts the flower, and the two spend weeks and weeks together. Unfortunately, Asriel can't feel any love in his new form, but he's longing to feel something. So he leaves to search for his mother in the ruins. But even after finding Toriel, he still can't feel love. Sure, he's got this new flower form, but because because he might not be able to feel any emotions at all, Asriel figures he has no reason to live. He decides to end his life, but he can't go through with it. He's too terrified at the thought of what would happen to him after he dies if he has no soul. Through the strength of his determination, he gains the power to reset. From here on in, Asriel goes by Flowey. For those that don't know, saving, loading, and resetting are both game and story mechanics in Undertale. Basically, only Flowey and then later Frisk have these abilities. Saving and loading work as you would think. If the player dies, they will return to the save point either automatically or by loading. Resetting brings the player back to where they first got the reset ability. To be clear, loading and resetting are not time travel. Some of the beings in the world will have foggy memories of the past, a kind of deja vu, but Flowey remembers everything. And so, Flowey resets the timeline thousands of times, doing everything he possibly can do in the underground. Eventually, he starts to kill monsters, pretty much out of boredom. Before long, Sans starts to catch on to all of Flowey's resets. So, Sans tries to put a stop to Flowey's killing rampages, and he actually succeeds a number of times. Unfortunately, the timeline just gets reset every time, so all of Sans's work is for nothing. The cycle continues. Sans becomes depressed. He can't see the point in trying to stop the violence knowing that everything can be reset. Flowey eventually gets bored with the killing and just lets time keep moving without him. While time is moving forward, several important events take place. First off, Sans befriends Toriel through the ruins wall. She makes him promise to protect any humans that come from the ruins. Undyne, meanwhile, gets promoted to the head of Royal Guard. Her friend Papyrus really wants to join too. She tells him that to become a Royal Guard, he needs to capture a human, which is basically a wild goose chase at this point, since no humans have been seen in the underground in years. Soon after, Undyne and Alphys meet for the first time at the garbage dump. Alphys has been spending a lot of time there since giving up on her experiments. The shame of her failure makes her feel like garbage, so naturally, the dump is sort of a safe place for her. I mean, geez, at least, you know, pick a nice restaurant or something and you know, sit by yourself having a nice meal or something. That's just, oh god, that's so depressing. Around this time, Muffet starts her famous spider bake sale. And now, we finally get to Undertale. Okay, we finally arrived at the main events of the game. Frisk, the player character, falls into the underground and lands right on top of a bed of golden flowers, which also happens to be Kara's grave. They encounter a strange talking flower there. It's Flowey! Since Frisk is a human, they have much more determination than Flowey. On top of that, Frisk also has the powerful ability to save and reset. Threatened by this newcomer, Flowey tries to kill Frisk, but Toriel saves them at the last second. She leads Frisk through the ruins and teaches them how puzzles work in the underground. Frisk explores by themselves for a bit until their path is blocked by Napstabluk, a sad ghost. Frisk manages to cheer them up. He's feeling so good that he shows Frisk his cool hat before clearing the path. Eventually, Frisk ends up at Toriel's home. Toriel assumes that Frisk will live with her forever. It's the only way for a human child to stay safe in the underground, after all. But Frisk insists on trying to find a way to escape to the surface. Toriel guards the exit of the ruins and forces Frisk to fight her. Even though she uses her magic against the human, Toriel never actually hurts them. When she realizes she won't convince Frisk to stay, she stops fighting. Frisk can choose to kill or spare Toriel. But since this is the pacifist timeline, they obviously spare her. Just as Frisk leaves the ruins, Flowey confronts them and antagonizes them. He says that even though Frisk managed to spare everyone for now, they won't be able to keep it up. And then he does that creepy laugh thing and disappears. Snowden. 
After emerging from the ruins, Frisk meets Sans, and after a series of bad puns, they meet Papyrus as well. While trekking through all of Papyrus's traps and puzzles, Frisk meets and spares a number of monsters along the way, including Snowdrake, Icecap, Lesser Dog, and Jerry. Frisk comes across Doggo and learns about special blue attacks. After petting the dog and freaking him out, Frisk pays a visit to the Nice Cream Guy. It's the frozen treat that warms your heart. After getting past the doggy couple mini-boss, a few more puzzles, and an encounter with the greater dog, Frisk makes it into Snowden Town. Frisk can wander through the town to their heart's content. Eventually, they walk to the edge of town and come face to face with Papyrus in a dramatic snowstorm. Papyrus wants to be Frisk's friend and is about to offer his friendship, but he can't. He must capture the human so that he can pursue his dream to be part of the Royal Guard. Reluctantly, Papyrus and Frisk enter the second boss fight. If Frisk's health drops to 1 HP, Papyrus won't kill them. Instead, he'll announce that Frisk is now weak enough to capture. He takes them to the Capture Zone, which is just the garbage dump. Frisk easily escapes and attempts the fight with Papyrus again. After the battle goes on for a while, Papyrus decides to take pity on Frisk and spares them. The snow clears and Papyrus laments on how he can't even capture someone as weak as Frisk and how he has no friends. Aww. But once Frisk offers their friendship, Papyrus cheers up. Papyrus tells Frisk why the Royal Guard is trying to capture a human, and then waits back at his house to go on a date with Frisk. He doesn't have to wait long because Frisk circles back and goes on a very silly date with Papyrus. It ends with them just being pals, but it was a real good time. And Frisk gets Papyrus' phone number before leaving town. Nice. Waterfall. Almost immediately after leaving Snowden, Frisk can choose to go to Grillby's with Sans. After an ominous conversation with Sans, Frisk continues through the waterfall area. They overhear Papyrus telling Undyne that he didn't capture the human. Frustrated, Undyne says that she will take matters into her own hands. A monster kid follows Frisk through the waterfall, and the kid's just dying to see Undyne. Yeah, see what you guys did there. After Undyne tries to confront Frisk a bunch of times, they fall into the trash zone. There they find discarded anime and battle Napstablook's cousin, the Mad Dummy. Then, Frisk goes to Napstablook's house and just kind of vibes a bit. Frisk makes a pit stop in the Tem village before reaching the end of the waterfall area and squaring up with Undyne. Undyne pursues Frisk all the way to the hotlands where she passes out from the heat. Cause, you know, she's a fish lady, of course. Frisk takes a cup from a conveniently placed water cooler and dumps it on Undyne, reviving her. Undyne is so grateful that she invites Frisk back to her home, which just happens to be where Papyrus is waiting for Frisk. He thought it would be fun for the three of them to, you know, kinda hang out. Anyway, Undyne gives all the details about her past with Asgore and why she can't let Papyrus into the Royal Guard. Then she accidentally burns the house down in an intense cooking lesson. Still probably went better than any meal I've ever tried to cook. Hot Lands. Frisk leaves Undyne's flame-filled home and heads to the lab in the Hotlands where they meet with Alphys for the first time. She's awkward, but nice, and says that she's been watching Frisk since they left the ruins. And then suddenly, Metaton breaks through the wall and forces Frisk into a dangerous game of trivia that Alphys helps Frisk cheat at. Frisk continues through the Hotlands where they guest star on a life-threatening cooking show. Ha <laughs> ha, come on down. Play matchmaker for a pair of nights and defuse a bunch of bombs while reporting live for Metaton's news broadcast. And after all that excitement, Frisk takes a break at the Spider Bake Sale and has to battle Muffet. You know, just because. Then Frisk makes it to the MTT Hotel and meets Bratty and Caddy, as well as Burger Pants, who objectively has the best name ever. The core is right behind the hotel, and it's full of puzzles. But not to worry, Alphys talks Frisk through the whole thing. Finally, Frisk battles Metaton and then Metaton EX after they flip the switch. The battle is being broadcast naturally, and its ratings are soaring. As Metaton's body begins to fall apart, he announces that this will be his final show in the underground. He starts taking calls. Love and support from Napstablook and other fans pours in. Metaton is so moved by their support and decides that he will stay in the underground after all. Then, his batteries die, and he passes out, ending the battle. But not to worry, Metaton superfans, Alphys checks on him after the battle to make sure he's okay. At the exit of the core, Alphys reveals that a human soul isn't strong enough to return home. They'll also need a monster soul, so Frisk will have to kill Asgore, the capital. 
To get a true pacifist ending, the player must have at least one neutral ending first. So to keep things moving, I'm gonna condense the first neutral ending and then pick up from there. After going through the capital, defeating Asgore, and sparing Photoshop Flowey, also known as Omega Flowey, the pesky flower pops back up and asks the player why they spared him. He tells the player that they could get a better ending if they go back and load their save file. Now on to the rest of the true pacifist ending. Once Frisk loads the game, they end up outside of the doorway to the barrier. Frisk then heads back to befriend Dr. Alphys, as per Flowey's suggestion, and before heading to the lab, Frisk sees Undyne and Snowden, and she asks Frisk to deliver a letter to Alphys for her. Turns out to be an unsigned love letter asking her out, and Alphys mistakenly believes that Frisk wrote it. And so Frisk goes on another date. Alphys decides to take them to the garbage dump. She and Undyne tend to go there a lot. Once Undyne shows up, she realizes that this whole thing was a mistake. Alphys admits to Undyne that she's been lying to make herself sound cooler. Undyne doesn't care, she just likes hanging out with Alphys. And she wants to help Alphys learn to be happy with herself. So, she hires Papyrus to be her life coach. Despite all the help from friends, Alphys realizes that to be her best self, she has to face her mistakes. Frisk then enters the True Lab. The True Lab. There, Frisk comes face to face with the Amalgamates. Frisk also discovers tapes from the royal family's past and learns about the Buttercups incident as well as Kara's death. Alphys tells the whole truth about the Determination experiments and decides that she is done hiding her past. She leaves Frisk to finally send the Amalgamates home. Once Frisk is back in the elevator, they get sent to Asgore's throne room to face him once more. The End all the monsters in the underground come together to try to protect Frisk from Flowey, but he just takes all their souls before revealing his true identity, Asriel Dreamer. Frisk battles Asriel, who transforms into his god of hyperdeath form halfway through the fight. After dying over and over again only to be revived through the strength of their determination, Frisk begins to save their friend's souls from Asriel. Toriel, Sans, and the whole crew are forced to fight Frisk until they're able to help them remember who they are. Eventually, Frisk saves all their friend's souls from Asriel, but there's still one soul left to be saved. Asriel's. Frisk begins to see flashbacks from Asriel's past and his relationship with Kara. After Frisk tries to save Asriel over and over again, he finally relents, and the real Asriel appears before Frisk. With the crew's healed souls inside of him, Asriel is finally able to feel again. He apologizes for all of his evil deeds, explaining that he loved Kara so much that when he lost them, he also lost his way. He decides to release all of Frisk's friends, destroy the barrier, and give monsters and humans the chance to peacefully coexist again. Frisk forgives Asriel for what he's done, and gives him a big hug. When Asriel is gone, Frisk wakes up surrounded by their friends. None of them remember what happened, but everyone is happy to be safe once more. Frisk is given the option to go back through the underground and say their goodbyes before returning to the surface. If Frisk walks all the way back to the start in the ruins, they find Asriel on the bed of yellow flowers. After speaking with Asriel, Frisk returns to the barrier and leaves the underground with their friends by their side. As they all watch the sun rise, Asgore asks Frisk to be the human ambassador for the monsters. This will be the dawn of a new era of peace. One by one, all of Frisk's friends leave until Toriel is the only one left. Frisk can then choose to either stay with Toriel or strike out on their own. And after a quick scene showing the monster's new life on the surface, the credits roll. Man, what an ending. Of course, that's just the ending if you choose to be nice. If you decide to go Captain Murder Pants and kill everything you see, well, there's a whole other timeline to explore there. So let us know if you want to see the genocide timeline as well. And make sure you subscribe to the leaderboard. From indie to AAA, we love the games you play. I've been your host, Mario Bueno. Thanks for watching. Oh, 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 oh,